As we journey through verse by verse from chapter 9, beginning with that 8th verse, and we journey through here, keep in mind that essentially today we're un, we're, we, are, we are dialoguing through two primary doctrines. Last week, you remember, we dealt with the doctrine of the gospel. And from Isaiah chapter 9, in those first seven verses, Isaiah lays out as plain of a, of a gospel proclamation as you can find anywhere in Scripture, the promise of the Messiah. It's unclear to us really, that, and I shared with you when we began the book of Isaiah, that it, it is not neatly laid out chronologically. Uh, it, it is at times quite confusing. Why would, why would Isaiah talk about this now and then, and then as we progress progressively through the chapter or through the book it appears that he's speaking about things that happened prior to the last thing he said and we've come to one of those moments we've we've already journeyed through a couple of them where there are some fast forward moves and then there's a, a half or a, a full step backwards in time we've come to this that it appears the scholarly world places verses 8 of chapter 9 through chapter 10 of verse 4 somewhere in the reign of Jotham. Uh, why is that significant for us? Again, if you, just for reminder's sake, in Isaiah chapter 1, we're, we're told and we're given a picture of the timeline that Isaiah uh, speaks and prophesies. Uh, in that first chapter, we know that the first king that Isaiah prophesies about is Uzziah. Uh, we've, we're, we're seen at the end of, Isaiah, of Uzziah's Rain, where Isaiah has that most popular, most familiar vision where he sees the king of glory. And, and then Isaiah will, will essentially skip over Jotham and move into Ahaz. And that's where we've been now for the last several weeks in our journeys through what Isaiah has been prophesying about what Ahaz, the ungodly king Ahaz, has done in his unholy alliance with Assyria. Well, from chapter 8, because of the things that Isaiah says here, it's clear that he's speaking about things that are before Ahaz's day. So it's likely, the scholarly world does appear quite agreed upon this, that it's probably in the late days of Jotham that these words that Isaiah is prophesying and speaking about are here. Now, another thing of note, of interest, Isaiah is a prophet to the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom is Judah, uh, the capital city, Jerusalem. Most of what Isaiah has to say in these verses are spoken about the northern kingdom. Uh, there, are, there are several ways in which the prophets would refer to the northern kingdom. Uh, they would, because she carries the name of, of their ancestry as the united kingdom as Israel, the northern kingdom carries that name <coughs> excuse me, with them. The name of Jacob, the name of Israel, the name of Ephraim, the name of Manasseh. Uh, the, 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 these are the names that Isaiah will use through here. And he's referring to, making reference of the northern kingdom. This is prior to their fall. And it is prior to some of the events that happen in Ahaz's day. Primarily, when we look at that last segment where they speak about where both where, where, where the northern kingdom will make an alliance together and come against Judah with their alliance that they make with Syria, not Assyria, but Syria. Well, we'll, we'll see those pieces as we take part of the technical portions of the text, and then we'll make way to the application, uh, and we want to get there quickly. So the Lord sends a message against Jacob, and it falls on Israel. That is technically to the northern kingdom. So Isaiah, where he does primarily prophesy to the southern kingdom, has these words to say about the northern kingdom. And he, he makes it clear to them. The people know this. When he says this, there is, there is nobody in the land who could deny that God's hand of judgment has come upon them because of their idolatry, because of their refusal to worship Yahweh and Him alone. And so Isaiah addresses, the first primary thing that he addresses is the sin of pride. You see that it shows up in its direct wording of it in the latter part of verse number 9. 
where, again, it's making references to the northern kingdom, making note of Jacob, Israel, Ephraim, and Samaria. Samaria being the capital city of the northern kingdom. And he's asserting, they are, the northern kingdom, are asserting themselves in pride. That's the last line of verse number 9. The asserting in pride and in arrogance of heart. So Isaiah is calling it straight out what their sin is. Arrogance and pride. It's, it's, it's the great Puritan preacher Joseph Aline that, that addresses this in this way. There are two, the two greatest dreads of all of humanity is that man would be at peace in their sin and that man would be pe at peace with their sin. They, they, they are quite different on the surface, but at the end, one progresses into the other. That when, when you become at peace with people sinning around you, you will eventually become at peace with being a sinner and a greater sinner even yourself. So we must guard this and we must be note of this and, and aware of this. And essentially this is what Isaiah is asserting here when he charges them by asserting themselves in pride and arrogance. They've grown at peace with sin. They've, they, they, they are not bothered by the idolatry of the nations around them. So they've grown at peace with their sin. And the effect of that has come in, the, in that it's, they're ex exercising it and asserting it in themselves. And the evidence of it is that in their own peace, in their own pride, and their own arrogance of heart before God. Now verse, verse 10 is referencing the fall of the northern kingdom where the bricks have fallen. But notice how they will assert themselves. But we will rebuild it. So the walls have fallen, not around the city of Jerusalem, but the walls essentially of the, of the northern kingdom by the essential or, or by the eventual attack of this Syrian, Assyrian nation. They will crumble and they will fall. But here stands this northern kingdom Notice they don't say, but God will rebuild the walls, or God will restore us. They say, we will rebuild. They will come in and they will cut down the sycamores. And what do they say? That's all right. They can do it. We'll, we will plant or we will replace them with better trees. They're essentially saying what God's provided for us, that's okay. But we can do better. That is epitome of pride and arrogance. This is the charge that Isaiah is bringing. Verse 11, therefore the Lord raises up. Note, the language is very clear. The Lord will raise up against them. He will, he will, and he will do it by this. He will bring up these adversaries of resin and he, and, and, and he will spur along their enemies. Now we'll go back just a couple of chapters and we begin to pick up who are these kingdoms and who are these rulers that are going to come in. Isaiah prophesies about them moving in and they're, 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 they'll come from Egypt, they'll come from Assyria, they'll even come from within themselves. And these adversaries, note, they don't come in on their own volition. God will raise them up to come in. God will raise them up to come against His people because they are asserting themselves in pride and in arrogance. So, we, so God will raise up these Syrians. Verse number 12 is a reference to the Syrians in the New American Standard. They're using their older name, the Arameans. But that is essentially the Syrians uh, to the east and the Philistines to the west. God will raise these up as well, even though they will attempt and make alliances with these other kingdoms to come and launch their attack against the southern kingdom. But God's going to use them even in their devouring of the northern kingdom. And they will devour, in that second line of verse 12, they will devour Israel as with gaping jaws, like a lion, like a beast, like a, like a ravenous beast coming unsatisfied, 
and in his mouth is gaping wide open, chewing up all that he can. And then comes this first of the four judgments. Now be sure that we listen to them closely and be sure that we do not misunderstand any portion of this. So, the, so, the, so from the New American Standard that I preach from, that I read from, I study from more translations, but just from the reading here and the, the text that I'm using in the proclamation here, he says, in spite of all of this. So in spite of what? In spite of the northern kingdom's pride and arrogance. In spite of that. You can begin to walk your way back to that, to that initial assessment of God about this northern kingdom. And you can see that in spite of all this, God will raise up adversaries. God will raise up enemies. What's He going to raise them up for? To deal with their pride and their arrogance. And God will do this. And do not be so foolish to think that God would not do the same for you. In spite of all of this, do not think that God will overlook your pride. Do not think that God is somehow satisfied with your arrogance of heart. In spite of this, His anger does not turn away and His hand is still stretched out. There's two statements that are not able to be... We should not handle them independently. They are one and the same. There is not a hand of God's wrath listed here. There is a hand of God's wrath and a hand of God's mercy. Do not be misunderstanding of that. But here is only addressing God's wrath. There is no mention of His mercy. That final stanza, that final line of the stanza, His hand is still stretched out, is not a picture of God's mercy. It is a picture of His hand of wrath it is stretched out even still against them. His anger has not finished. He has not turned away His anger. His hand is still stretched out. Tells us and gives evidence the reason why this would be so is best answered by the second stanza. Beginning in verse 13. One could almost say, in spite of God's wrath, the people do not turn back. You could, you, could, you could take the conclusion of the first stanza and say that it is the establishment for the first things that he says in the second stanza. His anger is not turned away, yet the people do not turn back. His hand of judgment is still stretched out, yet the people do not turn back to Him who struck them. Well, what did he strike them with? Well, he raised up foreign armies. He raised up adversaries to come and to bring his judgment. He has brought his hand of judgment. His wrath is, 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 is poured out. His wrath is stretched out. And he has struck them with his righteous wrath. So verse 13, Yet the people do not turn back to him who struck them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. We know this because we have the, the advantage of having the history of the northern kingdom and really the history of all of God's people at large by the record of it in Scripture. And so whenever we read these kinds of things, we know that, that God does indeed give His mercy and He makes His grace available to us. But we should not be thinking so foolishly is to think that just because God has mercy and just because God has grace, that it's automatically given to people who act against Him. You cannot think today. Do not be so foolish as to think that in your unrighteous living that God is somehow pleased with you. The nation of Israel could not and should not have thought so arrogantly and so boastfully. So here, verses 13 through verse 17 lays out the second charge against the northern kingdom. Let's read the text again and we'll be reminded of it. It's quite clear. Yet the people, beginning, I'm reading again verse 13, yet the people did not turn back to him who struck them. 
nor did he seek the face, nor, nor did they seek the Lord of hosts. So the Lord cuts off the tail of Israel, both palm branch and bulrush, in a single day. The head is the elder and the honorable man, and the prophet who teaches falsehood is the tail. For those who guide this people are leading them astray and those who are guided by them are brought to confusion therefore the lord does not take pleasure in their young men nor does he have pity on their orphans or their widows for every one of them is godless and an evil doer and every mouth is speaking foolishness now will Read that final stanza again, or that final, those final two lines of the stanza again in a moment. But let's see, what is the second charge? What is the second judgment that God brings against the northern kingdom? And it is in their refusal to repent. So they, they're first charged with pride and arrogance. And the stanza starts out because of God's or the second stanza begins with that final charge against them from the first stanza that God has brought His hand of judgment upon them, yet they have not turned back. That's that language of repentance. They have not repented. They're, 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 they're still so puffed up with pride and arrogance. They're rebuilding their own walls. They're replanting and replenishing what God has destroyed and what God has brought against them. They have not seen that God has brought His hand of judgment upon them, Rather, they've puffed themselves up with more pride and arrogance, and as a result of that, now they are refusing to repent. Even though it's clear that the hardship that they're in is because of God, because of His discipline against them. Even though they know that. There is no confusion over this matter. It will come because they're of the false prophets that He addresses here in the second stanza. But at the start of this, the people know that this is the work of God. God has raised up these adversaries and He's brought them against them. And so there is this refusal to repent. And you see it as it goes along. It speaks about the leadership of the nation. You can see this laid out in leadership of nations and leadership of churches in leadership of homes, and you can certainly personalize this on your own person, that this is the application. When we make to the application, it will fit perfectly in all of these four realms, nationally, to the church, and to the family, and to the person. Refusal to repent. What effects does that have upon a people? They just essentially grow more arrogant. And they've grown more prideful. They, 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 they are not at position now to want even for godliness to be a part of them. They, they increase in their godlessness. They increase in their evil doing. And how is this brought about? Again, it will be by the hand of God. God will give them teachers who will speak to them what they want to hear. This is true of Old Testament and New Testament. A stubborn and stiff-necked people will demand leaders who agree with them. Our pride and our arrogance, we must repent of. And why must we repent of it? And why must we repent of it quickly, immediately? Because it will eventually lead us into darker, deeper sins that we will even begin to hate truth. Much like this northern kingdom. Now there is one, well, there's many things to observe through here. Uh, I, I will not take the time to observe everything that's here just because of the sake of time. But can you imagine where in all of Scripture does God have an indicting word against widows and orphans? I can think of nowhere but here. Why, why would God speak like this about this northern kingdom unless the impact has even affected the widows and the orphans? The pride of the nation has impacted the pride of the people. And not just the well-to-do people. 
but the most vulnerable of the nation have embraced, because of the false preachers, because of the false teachers that have come along, and they've brought mass confusion upon the whole of the nation, the Lord Himself, in verse 17, the Lord does not take pleasure, and He begins to delineate, He begins to identify, He doesn't take pleasure in their children. He doesn't take pleasure in their orphans or their widows. And he says, why? For every one of them is godless and an evildoer. So that should, there's some, there's several things that should really stop us dead in our tracks. God doesn't just let somebody into his kingdom because of their difficult temporal situation. All people are held responsible for their righteousness. And Scripture tells us none are righteous. No, not even the widows and the orphans. Not even the children among us. Not even the, not even the most vulnerable of our society are given a free pass by God. All of humanity is held to the exact standard the same standard that the false teachers are held to. Now there will be sharper judgments given to them, but the standard is still the same. To the false teacher, to the leaders of the government, to the, to the, how, to the leaders of households, all the way to the children, and all the way to those who are without a husband and to those who are without parents. God holds all of humanity to the same standard godly standard and it's clear from Isaiah chapter 9 verse 17 that not even the orphans and the widows and the children are immune from this he says every mouth is speaking foolishness in spite of all of this in spite of all of this his anger does not turn away and his hand is still stretched out in spite of their refusal to repent in spite of their false teachings so that should tell us you know it's not a new argument in our day but it certainly is a loud argument that a God of love just wouldn't act like this I don't know what Bible they're reading. I don't know what God they're worshiping. But this God says, no, you do not get a free pass on this matter in spite of your refusal to repent. My anger is still not turned away and my hand is still stretched out. Two stanzas in, somewhere someone ought to be asking, well then where do we go to for help? Someone ought to be asking, well then, who can wash away my sins? Someone ought to be asking, is there any refuge from the wrath of God? Well, let's press on through the text. Verse 18, it doesn't appear there's any answer yet that will satisfy that question. There is a third Sin that God judges the people for. Verse 18 and following, The wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It even sets the thickets of the forest aflame. And they roll upward in a column of smoke. By the fury of the Lord of hosts, the land is burned up. And the people are like fuel for the fire. No man spares his brother. And they slice off what is in the right hand and, they, and they're still hungry. They eat what is in the left hand and they are not satisfied. Each of them eats the flesh of his own arm. Here's two more references to the northern kingdom. Manasseh devours Ephraim. Those are the two largest uh, uh, kingdoms that make up the those are the two largest tribes that make up out of the tribe of Jacob, Manasseh and Ephraim. And Ephraim devours Manasseh. 
And together they are against Judah. So there's that reference and that, that prophetic word that they will eventually align themselves together in their unholiness and in their, in their hatred for God and turn against their southern kinsmen. So what is this third sin that God will judge them for? And it is essentially their devouring of one another. So you have, a, you, you have first a charge against the nation that they are pride and they have an arrogant heart. And then God charges them because of their pride and their arrogant heart, their refusal to repent. And as a result of their refusal to repent, they become a devouring people upon themselves. They begin to launch an attack against themselves. They grow more wicked than they previously were wicked. So their wickedness burns like a fire. And you, we know this living in a, in a, in a region of the United States like we do, that there is, we, have a, we, have, we, we're, we do better than most regions of the world where they have a full four-season uh, climate. We have a five-season climate uh, where we have fire season, uh, which is a result of the summer season, uh, which is a result of how wet the spring season was or the winter season is. We know what it's like when a forest begins to blaze or when the grasslands or the desert begins to catch on fire. It is a scorching kind of an effect and it burns like a, like a rage of a fire. And the plume and the, of the smoke is clear and, and, and the devastation of it is certain. This is the effect of a people who devour one another. They devour their own. Their wickedness is so much that it's brought them to this position that now they, they have no loyalty to themselves. They have no loyalty to their family. They have no loyalty to their church, if you will. They have no loyalty to their nation. Their loyalty is only to themselves. And even that is in question in this third charge. They're so hungry they are so famished they are so starving the image is here that they're cutting off their left hand because they cannot find food because of the rage that god has brought upon the land there is no place to find food now this seems quite devastating this seems even so absurd that you might even feel like you need to plug up your children's ears because who would dare do this who would dare even cut off one hand so that they might survive? You have to understand the level of depression. You have to understand the level of the depravity of these people. That they would be willing to devour their own flesh to survive. Now we have to ask our, ourselves a question in this. Is Isaiah just using the, the benefit of imagery or were they really doing this? I don't think it either. I don't think it really matters if it, if they really did this or if he's just using the image of it, because the image is enough to shock us. The fact that he brings it up is quite devastating all by itself. Notice that what they do when they slice off what is on the right hand or on the left hand, so it's not just what they might be holding, but then each of them eats their own flesh of their arms. And notice they're still hungry. They are not satisfied. And so they begin to turn on one another. It's a morbid level of cannibalism. This is the we we, we normally would put the activity of cannibalism upon uh, upon an idolic people, a godless people. But we can't do that with this northern kingdom. They knew Yahweh. And look what's become of them. They knew truth. And look what's become of them. They know what is right and they know what is wrong, but yet look at them. Look what they've done. They're arrogant. Their heart, the very core. And Isaiah makes this proclamation. We'll see it even in further journeys along the way in Isaiah. Their hearts, our hearts, your heart, it's no different than theirs. It is altogether sinful, altogether wicked and ungodly. 
And an unrepentant, arrogant heart leads us further away from God and further to unimaginable acts. This northern kingdom, God's judging them for what, they've, what has become of them. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, is the fourth stanza of the poem that Isaiah prophesies with. It's the form, the literary form that he employs to deliver this prophetic word. So you see how far the progression of the sin works, don't you? You see it here. Woe to those who enact evil statutes. To those who constantly record unjust decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights so that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans. Now, what will you do in the day of judgment and in the devastation which will come from afar? There's that line of questioning laying here. The second one, to whom will you flee for help? What can wash away my iniquities? What can satisfy this wrath of God? He says in verse 4, nothing remains but to crouch among the captives or fall among the slain. The only thing that's left for you to do is to take refuge by the dead bodies of the carcasses that lay around you. And those being those you've devoured yourselves. The dead of your own activity is where they now seek their refuge. So you see this, this fourth judgment is, is they now are in position where they're passing evil laws. Now why would any nation pass evil laws? Well, they will pass evil laws because they want to do evil things. And the only way they can do evil things with a clear, con is with a clear conscience is to pass evil laws to give them permission to do their evil acts. Can any people, can any society rationally press forward thinking that somehow murder is an appropriate activity of the people? The cannibalism is an act that is is acceptable by God because we're surviving, we're, we're in this to survive our own freedoms, our own pleasures. We got to preserve our own way of life that we want to have. And so we begin to devour one another who is opposed to us. Or we want to press on in the things that we want to do. And so we must now enact evil statutes that give us permission to live in the comforts that we want to live in, to give us permission to live in the lifestyles that we now want to. And do not think that evil is overcoming God by this. See this and understand this for the, for the proclamation of what Isaiah is saying. This is the unfolding of the wrath of God. When a nation passes evil laws, it is not because evil men have overcome God. It is because God has removed His hand of mercy. And He has raised His hand of judgment upon them. This is Romans chapter 1 to us. We can never forget that, that devastating image of Romans chapter 1 where a people reject God and they put before them idols that they want to worship and essentially, eventually, they will be given over. God will, will give them over to this reprobate mindset that they have. Their arrogance of their heart, the pride, haughty positions that they've taken. And in doing so, they refuse to repent. And because of their repentance, their sin increases. And now they do things they said they would never do before. They do things that once they, they, they now do things that they once previously would have said are punishable crimes. But because they were once punish, punishable crimes, they now have to do something to give them permission to do what they must do in order to continue to live in their reprobate ways. Now, you're a rational people. We're a rational, logical people. You don't need 
much explanation as to how this applies to us. We don't have to look far to wonder how does this affect our own nation. You don't need to look to another church to wonder how would this affect our church. You don't need to look at another family's hardships and difficulties to wonder. I wonder what it would look like if, if God had His judgment upon them. You have your own household to examine. And you don't need to look at another person's heart to wonder how does this apply to them when you must stop and examine your own heart. This has implications upon the nation. And I would say upon any nation. This has implications upon the church. It has implications upon the family. It has implications upon you. If this is, and the argument here is, if this is the case, then what do we do? The truth of Scripture bears witness that it is the case of our pride and arrogant hearts. And that an unrepentant condition of sin, you could essentially say Matthew Henry is the one who makes it the clearest that the first judgment against sin is more sin. You, you, you go on in an unrepentant sin, you should expect that you must go further in that sin to be satisfied because the previous state of your sin is no longer satisfying. And what happens if you go a step further and you still refuse to repent of sin? A judgment of more sin comes into your life. A judgment of more devastation. Of, more, of a place that once you would have argued you would never be in. And now look, not only are you embracing of the laws, but now you're doing all that you can to advance the laws that would give you permission to do what you know is opposed to the law of God. What can wash away such sin? Who will you run to in this kind of help, for this kind of, of refuge? Is there any place of survival? Or will we be left like the northern kingdom to thinking that our only place of safety now is among those whom we've devoured? Well, there it is in verse 4, the fourth time that concluded phrase is there. In spite of all of this, in spite of what? In spite of the evil statutes that are passed by evil governments that are manned by evil men. And as a result of that, the, the best that a people can do. Now, God's already spoken in the second charge against the people about their unrepentant condition. And He includes the declarations about the widows and the orphans and the children. But He brings them up a second time for referencing purposes. To show the kind of devastation that the judgment of God has brought upon the nation. That somehow they'll think... This, this shows how... How, how much they don't have that they think, let's conquer the widows and take their plunder. Oh, I got an idea. Let's go down and rob the orphanage. I mean, what do orphans have? Nothing. So let's go and take over them and take their plunder. Do you see the kind of irrational thinking that sin progressively takes us to? We then think that what is nothing is now something we want to achieve and something we want to take in and have in of ourselves. And we think that the only place of safety, the only place of refuge is to go and crouch down among the dead. There, that will be our place. No, in spite of this, one would say, wouldn't God have mercy upon a people who have reached this state? Well, let's go ahead and say He would if they would repent. Let's go ahead and say He would if they would repent of their pride and their arrogant hearts. Let's go ahead and see that if, they, that if God were to give mercy here, He would do so 
because of His glory and the requirement and the necessity that these people do not continue living as they, as they currently or previously have been. And so in spite of all of this, His anger is not turned away and His hand is still stretched out. Well, before we make final application to this, I think we must be reminded of the dragnet parable of Matthew chapter 13, verse 47 and following. These parables that Jesus teaches and uses to teach, remember this, that these parables are taught not to give clarity to unbelievers, but to give clarity to those whom God has given ears to hear. So Matthew chapter 13, verse 47, Jesus, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it is filled, they drew it up on the beach and sat down and gathered the good fish into containers. But the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels, they will come forth and they will take out the wicked from among the righteous. At verse 50, and they will throw them, the unrighteous, he will, they, they will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the, the final state of an unrepentant people. This is the final conclusion not, not to be removed from the presence of God, but to be under the full wrath, the full pouring out of His, ray, of His wrath upon them in their unrepentant, unchanged estate. And so, whenever Isaiah makes these claims, in spite of all of this, one must ask and one must wonder, well then, is there hope for anyone at all? What will wash away my sins? What will carry me away from this iniquity? Where will I run to for help? Is there any refuge from the coming wrath of God? Well, in, before we answer that, we must make one final personal observation of this. What at all do we need to learn about from the, from the doctrine of the wrath of God and the doctrine of sin? If we do not learn what the Scripture wants to teach us from these four charges, then I fear the great problem will still remain that, that we'll remain in our arrogance and in our pride. Because we'll think these things are always about other people. No, dear church, I say we must humble ourselves and we must look closely. We must do as Paul the Apostle told, told the church in Corinth to do, to examine your hearts and see if the truth is in you. What could we learn and what should we learn about sin? Well, first of all, we already see through the four stanzas it is progressive. It increases there, there are essentially three root sins that one could, if we were to take all of the sins of, of humanity and, and, and begin to just process them back down to where do they originate from. Scripture helps us see this. That there are three basic places where sin originates or its root is founded. And it's found in pride. It's found in selfishness. And, it's found, and, and sin is found in our unbelief. And so when we, when, we in, when we go on in an unrepentant condition, we should expect that the sin that we previously are committing needs to be repented of, but we never get to the real source of the problem while we live in an unrepentant condition about these peripheral sins. One might say, well, it's just such a little sin, preacher. Do I need to repent of that as well? I would say to you, absolutely. You, you must look closely at your heart and see Repent of those 
sins that are hanging on the end of the tree that are bearing fruit of, of sin. But you'll, you'll always have to be repenting of that same sin over and over and over again. Isn't that part of the, the experience you have? So when will I overcome this sin? Because look, I'm always repenting of the same sin all the time. It's because you're really never dealing with the root of the problem. You're always dealing with when the fruit shows up. Oh yeah, I got that, I got, I got that lying problem. Oh yeah, I got that gossiping problem. Yeah, I got that lusting problem. Well, we must repent of these of these things that, that hang on the tree of our lives that, are, that bear evidence of a sin. But let's go deeper and see what can we learn about sin so that we can deal with it effectually. Well, do not forget that sin increases. Once pride has taken a root, once selfishness has rooted, once unbelief has taken root, it will only increase. It will be like every vine weed in your garden. You'll pluck it up as soon as it shows its weedy head, but you got a whole yard full of root. It'll just show up somewhere else. It will increase. It will lead toward rebellion against God. It will eventually lead to idolatry. You will eventually need to have another God who you worship because this God will not allow you to remain in your sin. In spite of your sin, His, His anger is still against you. His hand has not been pulled back. One could make an argument that sin is it, 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 it leaves a wasting effect upon you. It, it, it has a weakening effect upon you. Pride or selfishness or unbelief will make you weaker in your ability to obey the commands of God because now you're, you're, you're allowing that root to remain in an unrepentant condition. Sin will eventually turn its hand against itself sin will eventually devour you that which you're pursuing for pleasure it won't be long and some of you may not even realize the shackles are already on you but it will not be long that that sin will have you in its deepest darkest dungeons and you are wasting away this is the effect of sin you must deal with it the first judgment again Matthew Henry makes this this assertment I agree completely with him the first judgment of sin is more sin sin is a penalty of an unrepented sin expect that other sins will creep in and will begin to take root sin will eventually erode all of humanity sin will boast about its sin while taking the plunder of those who have nothing. This is what sin will do, and it's doing even right now. Sin will pass laws to encourage others to sin. Sin will sound reasonable. Sin will sound fair. Sin will sound loving. Sin will sound just. Sin will sound natural. Sin will be as though it is, that it, it, it is now not something that you occasionally do, but now it is something that is completely abiding in you. Do you not see what Isaiah is warning this northern kingdom of? Oh, look closely, dear church. Ask this probing question that Isaiah is not afraid to ask. What? What? will wash away my sins. What will cleanse this iniquity of my life? Who will I run to for help? Where will I go to seek refuge from the wrath of God? Well, church, are you ready to answer that question? Are you ready to proclaim what that answer is? Are you ready to point everyone in the room to where to turn to? Are you ready to do that through proclamation? Are you ready to do that through 
announcement. Are you ready to do that as a corporate body? Are you ready to give an answer? Do you even know what will wash away your sins? Are we at all able to make this proclamation to a sin-filled world? Maybe even today, some of you need to deal, deal immediately, quickly, with root sins that are still showing up in your life. Let's prepare ourselves for this kind of a proclamation today. What will wash away my sins?